Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the point you've been waiting for in this video. We're going to finally introduce to you the tarantula curve mixture design procedure. Yeah. I know. In this mixture design procedure, we're going to, it's going to be aggregate based. Why do we do that? Well, aggregates make up about 70 to 80% of the volume of the concrete mixture. So doesn't it make sense that whatever procedure you use to design that concrete mixture is really focused on those aggregates, what their characteristics are, what their properties are, and how that controls your mixture design? This is the tarantula curve mixture design procedure based on lots and lots of research hundreds and hundreds of concrete mixtures that we've used and put together lots of observations to help you design your concrete successfully. A lot of people have used this procedure and ideas to successfully design lots of concrete, especially in tough situations. In this video, I'm gonna explain the method, how it works, what it's all about, talk to you about it in details. And the next video, I'm gonna show you actually work through a problem give you a spreadsheet to help you do the tarantula curve mixture design procedure. But these notes are meant to be a guide. Here are the steps. Number one, find the binder content based on your aggregate shape, texture, gradations, etc. Number two, pick a water cement ratio and an SEM content for durability or strength. Number three, find the water content. That's pretty easy. Number four, pick an air content, also pretty easy. Number five, proportion your aggregates to be within the tarantula curve. Sounds kind of hard, but if you got the right materials, it's not that bad. Number six, you're going to trial batch and you're going to adjust your concrete mixture with admixtures. To do this procedure, you're going to need the specific gravities of all the materials. You're going to need the sieve analysis of the aggregates. You're going to need visual observations of the aggregate shape, cleanliness, and then you're also going to need a spreadsheet to help make all of this become a reality. I'm going to give you the spreadsheet in the next video. The first step in the tarantula curve mixture design is to find the binder content. And we're going to assume that we have a very good rock and sand source that's within the tarantula curve and we're gonna make adjustments for this later if you're not. We're gonna choose the amount of binder based on the desired workability that you wanna have with your concrete. This is done because the binder is really a big input into your paste, okay? And your paste is actually gonna act as a lubricant between the aggregates to help them move and slide to get whatever workability you're interested in. And this table is gonna help you do that. This table is set up so that you have your application you're doing, whether it's slip form pavement or a wall, whether you're doing hand placed, whether you're pumping the concrete for a deck or flat work or some kind of other structural concrete, whether you're dealing with highly flowable concrete for congested rebar cages. This will tell you the application. This is the slump. If you like to talk in slump, this, this chart helps you do that, okay? This is your binder content. This is what you're picking. This is your first input into the model. Another way to think about this is this is the approximate paste content in the mixture, assuming that air is not part of the paste, and also assuming you're using a 0.45 water cement ratio. Now, depending on what you're used to thinking about, what you're used to doing, you should pick the one of these columns to help you. But the goal here is that you're either going to pick a binder content or you're going to pick some kind of paste percentage for the mixture. Now remember, this is assuming that you had great aggregates, that everything was in the tarantula curve, everything was, was really where it's supposed to be. What happens if it's not? Well, we can make corrections. And to make a correction, all we have to do is um, add more binder or add more paste. For example, if our aggregates are slightly outside the tarantula curve, you're gonna add about half a sack, about 47 pounds of binder to that mixture. That's about one and a half percent 
of the paste. If your aggregates are significantly out of the tarantula, what does that mean? We'll talk about that in a second. You're going to add a full sack of cement or binder anyway to the concrete, or that's about a 3% paste content. Now, um, there are some times that you're so far outside the tarantula that adding more paste doesn't help you, that you're just in trouble. We'll talk about that too. Now, let's say you have aggregates that are dirty, okay? That's another half a sack. If you have coarse aggregates that are irregularly shaped, that's another half a sack. If you have fine aggregates that are irregularly shaped, that's another half a sack. So what this means is that you start out with this idealized, perfect aggregate. And if it's not right, you start adding these up. If you've got a dirty aggregate that happens to be irregularly shaped, that happens to be outside the tarantula curve, you're going to add two sacks more, or 188 pounds more of cementitious material to this mixture. This just shows you that these aggregate things are really important. They cost you money when they're not right. We're going to go over these corrections in more detail now. So you kind of know what I'm talking about. So what is a dirty coarse aggregate? Well, during the crushing process, it's pretty common to get very, very small particles. They're called dust of fracture that coat the outside of your aggregate. If they do that, it makes it hard for the paste to bind to the rock. It also increases the surface area of the materials in the mixture, and that requires more paste to get a certain workability. So you want to avoid this. And with some experience, you can figure out what is a dirty rock and what's not. The good news is you can wash the rock. You can wash out this dust of fracture. Okay, But if you've got a whole stockpile of it, and it's not washed, and it's dirty, you're kind of stuck. You kind of got to just use it up. So how do we know if we're slightly or significantly out of the tarantula curve? What does that mean? Well, based on my experience, if you're out of the tarantula on only one check, that means one place on the curve or possibly the coarse sand check or the fine sand check. If you're only off on one of them, and you're only slightly off, you're only off by about less than, less than 2%, then you can get away with half a sack of cement that'll probably bring you okay. It'll probably make things better. The tarantula curve is really drawn so that you're at the oh no limit. Like that's the, the edge of the cliff. And if you go over it a little bit, you can survive. But if you start to go over it significantly, you're gonna need a lot more binder, which means a lot more paste, or it might not work at all. And I've talked about that in some previous videos. But if you're outside by more than this 2%, or if you're out in, um, in more than one category, okay? If you're out by less than 2% in two or more checks, or if you're outside by any one check by 2% or more, you're gonna need even more, maybe a, a full sack of cement more, okay? And if you're out in the wrong category, as I said, then initial paste may not save you. And you may need to just get a different set of aggregates or just deal with the very challenging construction practices. So what are irregularly shaped aggregates? Well, we want cubical aggregates in our concrete. I've talked about this previously. I'll have another video in the notes, okay? So you, you can actually look that up if you want. But, and we can tolerate some flat and elongated particles. They don't have to all be perfect cubical shapes. That's what we're after, cubical shapes. Um, you can deal with some, but we've found, based on our research, that the best way to measure this is the ASTM D4791. Again, I talked about this in another video. And you want less than 15% at a 1 to 3 ratio. That means the long dimension to the short dimension being three, you want less than 15% of those. If you can have that, then that's a fine shaped aggregate. That's primarily cubical, okay? But if you start to get outside of this limit, you start to see like you need more binder, you need more paste to make that mixture work. We talked about irregularly shaped coarse aggregate. What's irregularly shaped sand? Sand is typically 
from natural sources. That's like river sand, okay? That is rounded because it's been in the river for a long time, and the stream has rounded the edges, okay? But that's not all the sand that's out there. Some sand is caused from crushing, or they like to call it manufactured sand. This can also be used in concrete. If the shape isn't too flat and elongated, and if they have the right size gradation, okay? So after all those corrections, now you have to pick your water cement ratio for durability or strength. And you would compare the water cement ratio you need for strength from a three-point curve. Talked about three-point curves in a previous video. Or from the durability requirements. And as I've, again, talked about in a previous video, ACI 318 provides some insights into some at least first shot at designing concrete mixtures for durability. But this simple equation helps you out. The water content you need is equal to the binder content, that's from the first step, multiplied by the ultimate water cement ratio you have to have for your concrete mixture. The next step is to pick the air content. So, you know, ACI 318 and 211, they try to specify the air content based on the nominal maximum aggregate size. I would recommend just using, just making it simple and using something like 6% air as your target air if you're looking for air and train concrete. And if you're having non-air and train concrete, then I would just assume 2% air in the concrete. Or if you know better, if you know that you need more air content for some reason, then use whatever you know. All right, now we're getting to the guts, the real thing that makes this mixture design procedure special, proportioning the aggregate. When you proportion the aggregate with the tarantula curve, you do all of it at once. You do the fine and the intermediate and the coarse all at the same time. It's a combined gradation. And you make it to be within this curve that we've been talking about. So we've chosen all the other ingredients besides the aggregates. And we've, we've, we've made all of our choices based on the true aggregate characteristics. That's going to be really helpful for us. We want to choose our aggregates so that they're within the tarantula curve. And we don't want them right on the edge. We don't. We want them to be a little bit away from the edge. How come? Well, because our aggregates are going to probably vary a little bit. The gradations are not perfect. Every single truckload of aggregate to a job site is not going to have the exact same gradation. And so you want to be a little bit away from the edge. So when this variability happens, you don't go over the edge and start to cause you constructability problems. And it gives us more flexibility in how we use our actual designs. So to do this, I usually use a spreadsheet. And we're going to do this in the next video where we actually work an example problem together. And I look at the aggregate gradations on something called the percent retain chart. Okay, And I try to pick sources that don't have a lot of overlap at different sizes. Or at least I know what the overlap is. I'm gonna talk about this in the next video, okay? But this is really important because a lot of overlap means you're at a high spot on the tarantula curve. And a high spot on the tarantula curve means you're gonna have constructability problems. Next, I choose an initial amount of each type of aggregate. This is a guess. A pure guess based on experience. It may be a totally horrible guess, but I'm going to start with something. Then I'm going to iterate until I get the right volume, 27 cubic feet, and gradation that is within the tarantula curve. Typically, when I make my first guess, I assume that I have about 40% coarse aggregate by volume. And then I have 20% intermediate aggregate by volume. And I have 40% fine. That's just a first guess. That doesn't mean it's going to work. That doesn't mean it's going to be right. It's just a first guess to get you started. Or you can think of this in terms of weight. And these numbers are going to change depending on a lot of stuff. Your specific gravities, your volume of air. It's going to depend. But, but again, this is just a first guess if you have specific gravities that are typical of coarse aggregates 
and fine aggregates used in concrete. If I have a low slump mix, I'm going to start out something like this. If I have a pumpable mix, I'm going to start out something like this. These are just a first guess, and I'm going to iterate based on the aggregate gradation. Also, the cost is big time. This is a huge, huge advantage of the Tarantula curve. You can actually take into account the cost of the different aggregates. We've already minimized the amount of binder in the mixture, so we're minimizing that cost. Now, we can choose from lots of different sources to help to minimize the cost of the concrete mixture even more. And then ultimately, after we get this figured out, this is our idea. We're still going to have to do moisture corrections. You don't get away from moisture corrections with this. Still have to do them. And then I'm going to trial batch. And during the trial batching, the admixture dosage is going to be adjusted. It's going to be tweaked with to find the desired workability. And if your mixture requires really, really large doses of admixtures, then you should probably repeat the process. That means one of the assumptions that we made earlier about good aggregates it's probably not right. Or some other, some, something else is actually causing trouble. But you would, you would go over this whole process again with more binder in the mixture. And again, go through the process after that. You should check your workability, your strength, and your durability. And let's talk briefly about the limitations of, um, of this method. So this design method is very young. Okay, ha hasn't been around a long time. And so it's evolving rapidly. We're getting new ideas. We're seeing new things. Okay, But the research is sound. We've used 13 different coarse aggregates, like four different fine aggregates to look at this. Hundreds and hundreds of mixtures. A lot of people have successfully already used the tarantula curve to design concrete mixtures. So there's a lot of good stuff about it as well. But you're also going to have to check your gradations because if those gradations are off, then your mixture design needs to change. You're also going to have to look at your aggregate characteristics closely. If they deliver a dirty batch of aggregates, you need to wait, pay attention to that. And you're going to need a spreadsheet to do all this for now. But spreadsheets are pretty easy to use. The world's getting a lot more adjusted to them. And paying attention to all these things are something we should do anyway. So that's it for the introduction to how we truly dig in and use the Trillantial Curve Mixture Design. Thanks.